I, I always find people are too ambitious about AI. That's how I find that was a pitfall. Like, uh, I'm an engineering background. We have to be realistic about exactly what this can do and what it's good at. That was Ray Lowe from Intel. And I'm your host, Kenton Williston, the editor-in-chief of Insight.Tech. Every episode, I talk to a new expert about the latest ideas and trends that are pushing IoT innovation forward. Today's show is a look back at the ways AI changed in 2020 and a look forward to what's ahead in 2021. There's a lot to talk about, so let's get to it. So, uh, Ray, I just want to welcome you to the show. Could you tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do at Intel? Great. Yes. Hi, Kenton. Uh, so my name is Raymond. Uh, I'm at Intel as the software evangelist for OpenFino. So OpenFino stands for open. Fino is visual inference. And then no means neural network uh, optimizations. So it's a big name. But what it means is when you have a CPU, uh, you want to run the fastest possible neural network on it on Intel. You run this tool called OpenFino. And that's what I do. I've been giving this news to many people at Intel. Very cool. And how long have you been in this role? Pretty recent. Uh, I joined about four months ago. Uh, and I've been giving talks at Intel and all that. Well, you know, one of the first things I wanted to ask you, given your background there, is just what exactly AI is. And so to put some context around that, we've been on the Insight.Tech program doing a lot of work around the OpenVINO platform and its applications in everything from machine vision to, uh, you know, predictive analytics. Um, so, you know, there's there's a pretty broad scope of stuff that, th that people think about when they say AI. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are related terms, deep learning and machine learning. And I think oftentimes all these things get conflated and it's a little confusing mm -hmm. as to which thing is which. So you want to give us your primer on what in the world AI is and how it differs from these other ideas? Sure. Maybe I'll put one line about my background. So from a perspective from my side. So I did my computer science from Toronto and then I got my PhD there as well for a computer engineering degree. So my thinking about AI is, um, well, AI stands for artificial intelligence, right? So we always think about this way to, you know, emulating, simulating, you just want to make a brain that behave like human, right? So things like, you know, predicting, predicting things like object recognition and all that. But what I always see people confuse is um, there's a part called machine learning. There's a part called deep learning. So those three category people always think about them in a mixed way. I always think AI is like a big umbrella that cover many of that. And within that, you have machine learning. And within machine learning, you have something called a deep learning. It's like one category, like the neural network, where people I'll say more recently because of the computation power allow us to do that. So it become a lot more popular recently because back then when I was starting school about 15 years ago, when you're doing this kind of math, it, it may take a year before the training was finished. But today um, we talk about weeks, maybe days. And if you're very smart about it, uh, maybe in a couple of hours, you can get some results done. Yeah, it's amazing how much progress has been made, which leads me to ask, you know, this, this whole podcast, I wanted to talk to you about what are the trends that you've been seeing in 2020. So you know, just kind of open-ended question for you. Uh, beyond the amazing continuing mm -hmm. increase in processing power, what do you think some of the biggest trends of the year were, you know, not only AI, but deep learning, mm -hmm. machine learning, all, all the related areas? Right. right. Because in the last year, I'll say you hear a lot of podcasts talk about computer vision side, which is my background too. But I start to see the trend of um, called it beyond vision. So we will be seeing application like uh, NLP, natural language processing. Uh, it's mature a lot recently. For example, um, one trend I saw were um, something called a BERT was a new, um, I would say a framework and algorithm people created for doing natural language processing. And the results is astonishing. So uh, it can actually, what, what they can do is they optimize it, fine tune it for applications or tasks uh, called squat. It's like, it's a Stanford um, question and answering database. So they can literally answer question better than human. So if today I take the SAT test, I don't think I can win. <laughs> so things like that. So it, it's, it's kind of like, okay, there's certain tasks that now today machine can do so fast and so, so much better than human. So that's one trend I saw is um, in call center, 
uh, especially this year is such a crazy year. Uh, we've seen a lot of like disasters, like bad things happened. So uh, one trend where call center are now automated a lot better um, than before. So they have machine learning behind it to answer the call and then translating what you said, um, direct you into the right system or sometimes even answer questions for you. Yeah, for sure. And happily, I haven't been in a situation, you know, an emergency situation or anything like that uh, where I needed to get a quick response from a call center. But just, to, you know, even on my own daily experience, you know, I've got an iPhone and Apple Watch and all the rest. And when Siri first came out, it was just really a joke. You know, you could ask it to set a timer maybe, and maybe you would get that right, but it was pretty bad. And uh, now it's gotten to be very perceptive. Like um, the other day, I happened to be reading my daughter a book that talked about the design uh, called a fleur de lis. And I tried to make a drawing of it to show her what it was. I was like, well, this looks terrible. Let me just see, you know, Siri can help me out. So I just, you know, raised my wrist to my mouth and asked Siri to show me a fleur de lis. And sure enough, there, there was an image of a fleur de lis on my watch, right? It's gotten to be very good at answering broad questions and, and same for all the rest you know alexa and all the rest of those too they're they're much much better than they used to be even just you know like say a year ago exactly and that's i even forget how to set an alarm sometimes i have to really like uh you know google alexa or like just i just tell a story rather than getting into the menu and all that so there's a lot of tasks like what you talk about become a lot more natural to human uh, and behind the scene, you can actually see all the data center crunching all this data for us and then doing all this heavy lifting. And that's why I really find it's really cool in this year. Yeah, for sure. And of course, you mentioned the difficulties we've had this year and everything that's happened around the pandemic, of course, has been um, really dominated, not just the tech industry, but what's happening in the world at large. But I think um, as, as difficult as that situation has been, there's also a lot to be excited about in terms of how all of these smarter technologies helped the world respond um, to COVID. That's correct. Uh, I actually did a, like, I think it was, I was at Google before Intel. So I was like looking at some of the case study that they did, uh, how they scaled the call center. So uh, that was really life-saving because um, with all those like emergency, they talk about millions of call in a day. And when we think about it, where do you get millions of people, <laughs> right? How, how, can, how can, like, especially people at that level of stress, they want to get simple answer. And those are really, I think, um, it's really the future. Um, it's not even, we always think about, oh, we worry about the jobs, but those are the jobs that's not even we can be able to scale to, and then sometimes essential for us. So I find that this, yeah, something very new to us. Yeah, for sure. And and I think you're making a really good point there about um, there's the longstanding concerns that the robots are going to come and take all of our jobs, which, you know, there is some merit to that. Certainly automation has changed the job landscape, broadly speaking. But I think AI is really poised to, um, you know, do jobs that just weren't possible before and uh, also free people up from the really ugly bad jobs to do things that are more pleasant. So you know, one example that you know, again touches on the pandemic situation we've been in are the many different kinds of machine vision applications to do things like scan crowds for fevers. Or um, one nice one I was just reading about is a simple digital display that's paired with a vision system to tell you, hey, there's X number of people in the store. So it's a really non-invasive way um, non-confrontational way of saying, you know, should you feel safe entering the store or not? You know, is this, you know, meeting with regulations to enter the store or not? And that's a job that would be pretty uh, unpleasant to do as a human being. Right. And I think I see, I work with partners uh, a lot in Intel. So, uh, for example, at top of AD Link. Um, so they released uh, tools together in Logistic House. So it's Christmas time, guys, right? We're getting a lot of gifts. Uh, just millions of millions of maybe billions of packages sending around the world. And then they scan that, double check that for you before you receive them. And I think just reducing maybe 0.1% of the error rate, just 0, 0 0.1 maybe, it's, a, it's like a, such a huge deal. Like you may imagine all the gas you waste, all the energy you waste to deliver a, something wrong. And having those checks in place is such a great thing that's happening in the industry. And so as inspections, right, uh, safety, I saw like those um, 
for example, uh, it will check the tool for you if there's anything defected. Uh, like for car, for example, inspect the wells. Uh, those are life saving for me, and I find those a type of job that even you give it to human, you don't want to afford that zero point one percent error. Yeah, absolutely. And just goes back to your point you're making about how in many applications, machines are doing much better than a human could ever hope to do. So it's it's not even a question of you know are you replacing a human? It's just something a human just could not do. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, though, we've, we've talked about a couple of key areas. So I think one of the key areas in 2020 for sure was machine vision. There was a lot going on there, whether it was, you know, an industrial setting like you're describing doing inspection of, of packages and parts and whatnot, or in the more public sphere to do things like tell if people wearing masks or not. Um, and of course, we talked a little bit about language processing, I think has also been really, really important. Um, what other areas have you seen some important movement in? Mm, I want to give some suspenses because I see a lot of things in the industry. I want to talk about AR as well coming up, um, something that I personally work on. Um, so before Intel, I was a CTO for a company building augmented reality headset. Uh, so more recently, I think you may have seen um, from various company like Facebook, they are releasing uh, augmented reality headset. Uh, but behind the scene, we start to realize a lot of um, machine learning will get into the place like recognizing places, uh, landmarks, uh, like a lot of decision like that will make for you. It's not going to done by a human behind the scene to say, okay, trick it this, show you this, right? So um, they start to look into a lot of those efforts that I have seen are uh, quite amazing. So um, for example, uh, six, seven years ago when I did the slam tracking, and once you have the landmark, right, I always have the question, now what? <laughs> right, now what, right? I have a landmark, now what, right? So the often the after the layer is how do you take this data and then generalize it or create methodology so that people can utilize them. Uh, like one way I've seen is, um, okay, now you have a scene. Now you recognize the chair, you recognize the table, and you make a scene of information that you can use for content, right? So I had an application at one point, they generate a workspace. When you see a desk, a chair, it automatically generate like a virtual screen and keyboard and mouse, everything like a setup as if it's in the real world. I find that super cool because um, it's like a sci-fi movie, but I work on research for many years and that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it, it strikes me that that's also a really great example of the different kinds of machine intelligence because there's, um, I'm sure, elements of, of deep learning and machine learning in terms of recognizing the scene and then, you know, some AI to decide well, what should I do now that I recognize the machine? And I think really illustrates how all these different concepts play together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you ask me, I never say it's one application, but I see like a set of tools like that work together, turn into a new experience for a human. And and it's like today you're going to uh, shopping, right? You you often may pull up your phone to look for the barcode and look for the discount and et cetera, et cetera. But think about we can automate the entire process. You just walk in the store, pick up the best thing, the coupon or the automatic applied. You just focus on the shopping instead of like trying to go through that painful experience. And then that's what we've been seeing in the retails. Uh, a, lot, a lot of automations are happening and behind the scene was real uh, machine learning driven. Some of them, of course, what we talk about with the tracking and helping the people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I did a podcast series recently um, talking about retail, and there's so many interesting examples there. Like one that really made me laugh was uh, there was an application where they used uh, the RFID to do some analysis of uh, theft that was happening in the store. And they discovered that one of their biggest sources of loss was actually people taking products from one floor and then going up to another floor and saying, oh, I need to return this and I don't happen to have the receipt, et cetera, et cetera. So there was theft that was happening without anything actually leaving the facilities. <laughs> so lots of lots of interesting applications for mm -hmm. sure. And and that makes me think, you know, with with all of these concepts becoming so prevalent across, I think, pretty much every industry, would you say that for developers getting skilled in machine learning and AI are are becoming really a requirement? I felt like 
today, when you think about using machine learning, AI, it's like back then when I was start doing math and talk about calculus and linear algebra. <laughs> it's, it's like fundamental that if you don't use those tools, you may be missing out for a lot of potential applications. And of course, you don't have to use it for everything. For example, you just want to print a hello world on the screen. You don't have to take up your machine learning textbook tonight. Okay, it's not designed for just doing something simple, right? Uh, but I see that as a momentum that I see a lot. Um, I did some research on the, um, the trend on the machine learning. I think it's published by Stanford too. So uh, in the last 10 years, the growth war close to exponential. So uh, the number of conferences with the attendees, like they double, double every year. So it's the publications in Europe, China, uh, America, and the patterns that we file related to uh, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, so this is something I find like, uh, just like back then when we talk about internet, right? And this is pretty much happening again. Uh, it's like something that if you have a phone, doesn't have a camera and internet, it's like, it's not working. <laughs> That's how I felt now. If you're trying to get into this field today without having some fundamental, uh, it may block you from your creativity. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. But I think on the other side, you know, when I think uh, someone who's new to this field starts looking at like the diagrams of convolutional neural networks and things like that, it can be a little overwhelming. Mm, exactly so why we have open phenol. That's exactly uh -huh. what we, okay. I'm not trying to upsell <laughs> this, but, <laughs> but well, that's why we have open Fino to encapsulate a lot of the optimization steps, which I don't think you want to get a whole PhD on that problem. Uh, and <laughs> it's really hard. Like just getting the quantization problem right is very difficult. So that's why in Intel for open Fino, we have um, a lot of engineers just focus on those big problems, uh, like how to get the exactly what I talk about performance wise or just getting the tool together so that you don't have to learn everything, but for, but you have to know it, of course, fundamentally with mathematically, what does it do? But for the deployment perspective, for the development perspective, not engineering perspective. When I was thinking about development is like copy and paste code, make, a, make, make something quick and easy first and prove your concept like a prototype. Now today, uh, we had a couple hackathon. In a week, they build something I spent six years on in my PhD. I was like, oh, that's not fair. But that's the reality, right? Yeah. That's the reality, right? Uh, that's, that's what's happening. Well, and that just seems to me, broadly speaking, how AI platforms and deep learning platforms are evolving in general. You know, mm -hmm. like you said, even just a couple of years ago, to develop some of these applications would be a huge amount of work. Um, and now there's so many platforms that offer you know, pre-packaged models or, uh, you know, even things like you were talking about uh, using Slam, like um, you get like a little sort of d developer kit that has a mobile robot and, yes. you know, ROS operating system and the Slam right. already built into it. So, you know, it's it's giving you a tremendously advanced foundation to start from. And you still need to do work, of course, to, to implement whatever it is you're doing for your specific application, but you don't have to get bogged down in all of the you know, the fundamentals as it were. Exactly. And that's why I believe too, uh, a slam took me millions of dollars to build. It was no jokes. My journey where I have to find a professor, then do a collaboration. Then from the collaboration, I have to sign a contract. From the contract, I get the source code. I have to maintain the source code. Then from the source code, I have to debug. And then we went back and forth for half a year. That was the reality I was facing. But today you download a package, it's been tested, calibrated, and hardware software is all working together. And then that's, that's the new reality we're facing. Yeah, exactly. Much better. Much so, better. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you are a developer looking to get into this field, what would you suggest as a way to get started? I would definitely recommend people start looking at like existing tools um, because we spend a lot of time and effort. Well, I'm not going to say only open, you know, but TensorFlow or the open tool in the market and get familiar with the framework and then the understanding of the mathematics. I, I still think uh, mathematic-wise, you have to go through it. Uh, even you don't have the math background, there's a lot of good lessons from Coursera, even OpenFino have Coursera courses that you can take and get that understanding. Once you have that understanding, now you see the possibility, then you get into the nitty gritty details. So we have a lot of demo code you can try. Try all the demos. I, I love demos because it opened up the Im imaginations, right? Uh, when I work with a lot of developers, uh, surprisingly, a lot of them are from India, they are uh, students. They come up with like new ideas that 
I never even thought about, right? Uh, because and I asked like, how do you think about those? Oh, I remember I tried this demo and I tried this demo and tried this demo. Then I combine all this demo together, I get a new demo. I was like, wow, that reminds me of Legos, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, having that understanding, having that flexibility, having things working in a modularized way and putting them together is the new trend. Um, so I think that's where I think a lot of people should focus in the beginning. Just don't get bogged down on just one technical detail now, but instead think bigger, see if we can solve a world problem. And once people understand it, love it, get a team together. Now the resource will come to you because now you, you're proving your point, right? So I think it's much better than before you gotta be in a research for four years on one particular small problem. And then that's it, right? That's how I see it differently. Yes, yeah, so I think one question that leads me to is, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of painting a picture here of uh, you know, almost a blue sky environment where you can just really be creative and put all kinds of, uh, new ideas together in ways that people hadn't thought of but you know obviously anything you're doing has to fit within the budgetary constraints which you know not just the dollars but you know if you've got power constraints or you've got some kind of a rugged environment where you might have uh you know different thermal constraints or whatever so you know where do you see the state of the art in hardware now and, and I'm, I'm wondering in particular if there are advances that the you know, the broad developer audience might not know about that would raise the ceiling on what's possible inside of these constraints. That's a very fundamental problem when I work with my partners, right? So once you have a use case, uh, I think now I would say sky or the space is the limit because uh, we had uh, one success story where someone put the um, Mufidius VPU on a satellite. So, like that has a much, much harsher requirement than anything else because uh, beyond just thermal, they have to think about radiations. They're going up to the space. So um, so things like that, I think um, when we building product today, um, today we have a lot more flexibilities too. Um, back then you are constrained to a extremely power hungry GPU or, or maybe at that time may not be powerful enough CPU that's not optimized for the code. Uh, now it's a lot better and a lot better. And or you will be really stuck onto something extremely low power, low performance, like a Raspberry Pi at one point. Uh, but today I think we have a lot of uh, hardware accelerator platforms available. Uh, like uh, just recently OpenCV related, uh, released a project called OAK, Oak. And now you have a camera with a billion Intel uh, hardware, acceler hardware accelerated processor in it. And then it just changed the landscape, how we think about processing. Um, we always think about processing as like a device, a processor, or maybe an extra processor like a GPU or maybe something on top. Then you have a cable that connect everything. But with those kind of new approach right now, it's like everything in one chip. Uh, like you have the Intel chip next to the, <laughs> to the image processor. And then you may even have a slightly underpowered CPU there just to do some easy crunching. And you can connect that to a host to do even heavy lifting. And that's how I see the architecturally hardware is uh, converging a little bit. But back then was a uh, stuck tape. I'll call it duct tape. Just you have some kind of USB cable, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> USB 3.0 cable. It was a horrible thing to me. Latency was crazy hard. You have um, so many issues powering. So today you see a lot more condensed into one single element. And then I see that as one of the next thing. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that basically any hardware you look at these days is starting to acquire some AI capabilities. Like I know the most recently released um, Intel Atom processors, which you know you wouldn't generally think of as being super high performance processors, you know, have some AI acceleration built into them. So even at that level, you know, there's a lot you can do. You exactly that's the one that went on the satellite. <laughs> oh, okay. There perfect. we go. You you pick on the right one. See, like. Given all these choices and platform, now even on a space program, people are able to think, okay, now I have one watt of power available. What can I do? Because all they have is a solar panel. But now they can do so much more because with that project, now the problem is not just power, right? They have bandwidth. It takes so much time to transmit one image. So every image is so important, but they can crunch a couple images because they have enough power from the sun. So then they actually process the image, make sure it's not garbage image. It's nice. It's like satellite image, right? When you take a picture of a cloud, what do you see? Cloud, right? You want to see houses. You want to see landscape. Yes. Now, because of that processing, they say, I don't remember the exact number, but 
that changed the whole dynamic about the whole efficiency there. And that's, I think, that's the innovation that people are thinking now and just like readjusting the problem statement. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm glad you said that because that was exactly what I was thinking that, you know, it's not just, oh, you can do all these new things, but it's a matter of you, you can come at the problem from a totally different angle than you would have before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's good to rethink your architecture. And you know, a very simplistic example of this would just be the way that, um, you know, all this machine learning, deep learning has very often been split up into train it in a big power hungry data center or cloud or whatever, and then deploy the inferencing at the edge on something really, really lightweight, you know, put the right processing, the right smarts in the right place. And, and to your point, you know, all the other things you can do too, you know, what can you do to rethink uh, where the data flows? So maybe you do processing in, in a location that previously would have just been a transmitter of data, et cetera. Exactly. And people still get confused between the training and deployment. They always think AI must be extremely power hungry. Yes, on the training phase, because you're trying to teach the neural network, right? But once you have the network ready, the deployment, uh, that's, I think we have to really care, think twice, <laughs> like the deployment is a different problem than the training. And of course, there's different type of um, machine learning problems that may require real time training. But for most of the stuff with detection, like what we talk about, detecting the cloud, those or once you train it, the neural network will actually be able to detect those very quickly and then we be able to deploy them very differently. Because I do think it's useful to explore, you know, where the biggest challenges lie in AI and machine learning, you know, what some of the common pitfalls are and I what see. developers can do to, to avoid those. Yeah, I, I, I always find people are too ambitious about AI. That's how I find that was a pitfall. We, as a, like a, I'm an engineering background, we have to be realistic about exactly what this can do and what it's good at. So I did a challenge about uh, doing image classifications, right? And I give it to many candidates. I say, okay, run this code, put on your own image and see what it can do. Even it's amazing at 90 something percent, 80% of accuracy, but that 20% of error is hilarious. <laughs> so if you think about deploying a, deploying a tool for use cases, you have to really understand the use case and align with your expectation on the accuracy. Is 80% acceptable? A lot of time is a no, <laughs> right? And it's amazing, but it's a no, it's a big no. And people have to really learn that in the early time before they deploy. And why is it funny is um, we did that challenge, people put, um, a Tesla on it, it's really funny. So the Tesla is not, uh, the Cybertruck is not part of the database. It came up, the answer as a Jeep plus a beach wagon. I was like, oh, that's <laughs> correct. But I don't think <laughs> the marketing team will appreciate that, right? So yeah. think about things like that. You have to really learn what you're doing and make sure it aligns with your use case. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, there's some instances like I've seen um, some pretty funny examples of AI trying to classify whether what it was looking at was a muffin or a dog. <laughs> and it looks very similar. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and that's exactly. very funny. But uh, of course, if you're doing something like, you know, trying Medical. to predict when a very expensive machine is going to fail or right, exactly. anything that has any kind of ethical implications, all of a sudden it's, it's much less funny and you need to be very, very thoughtful. And mm -hmm. I, I think that there were some big lessons learned this, this year about um, being ethical with AI. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think conversations that really needed to happen. In Intel, we actually form a group just on that topic. I think it's extremely important um, to understand what you do. Does it, hurt people? Does it have any sort of damages? It's ethical, right? That term is such an important thing because it's like you have great power. Uh, what's it called? When you do sudo on a Linux, right? Great That's power right. come with great responsibility. Yes, yeah, sounds a little bit old, but it's happening, right? Uh, so that's something I think we have to all look very careful into, especially for medical. Think about this. You're doing that diagnosis, right? Is that 1% good enough, right? Is it ethical to say I can accept that 1% error? Is it gonna do something harmful to people, right? Those have to go through, you know, a lot of rigid testing, approval, and making sure things are right. For sure, for sure. And you know, going back to an earlier point you made, there's some things that machines can do now far better than humans, but there are definitely times when you really need a human in the loop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that that's it's really even in the training part. So if, you know, I just mentioned, for example, you know, monitoring expensive machinery. 
you know, it, it's it would be unwise for a developer mm -hmm. who's not familiar with whatever equipment this is to think that they could mm -hmm. just go out and collect some data and interpret it. I mean, you really need the human being who's been operating that machine to help you understand what the data really means. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because back then we have data biases and then create problem down all the way to recognizing become racist, becomes many bit of bad things can happen to the system when it's yes. not really carefully uh, reviewed and monitored. And that's one thing I think uh, we got to be really careful. And then I think uh, as on everyone have the good heart, it'll be okay. Right, absolutely. So kind of zooming back out to the big picture, you know, I wanted to again recap what we've seen happen in 2020. Um, you know, so far we've talked about things that have happened in terms of the advancement of the platforms on the hardware side on, and on the, you know, the development software development side, um, the ways people are coming at problems in different ways, how important this has all been to the pandemic response. Um, any other big picture trends that you're keeping your eye on? It's open source. I think that's one thing we always underlook. Uh, this, it's like the whole open Fino effort, a lot of uh, TensorFlow effort, a lot of AI effort are open source. So it's something that is not very common um, back then uh, with a lot of the corporate I work with in the past. So oftentimes you may have a solution, one off, you have to pay for license fee, or you don't even see anything. And there's no way you can adopt and change with the rest of the community. So the open source and community, and then that's why I talk about open Fino as open. I find it's very empowering because I've seen a lot of use cases are done by the community now uh, that I've never seen. Like, um, for example, OpenCV is our partner. They have their own open community. And then within the community, they take on both tools and then they create new tools. And that's one thing that happening in the next two to three years, we will see those new tools that open source are mature and then getting to the point that uh, will be the new standard. Uh, open standard, open source for AI is a new big thing for me. So what do you think that will enable? Is it just a matter of you know, increasing the ability to come up with these creative ideas and, and put things together in a new way? Or is there something more beyond that that you foresee? I will see it's like, um, uh, it's like a two or three, three phrases, right? Like uh, it's like Linux in the beginning will be like, oh, it's a small community, but eventually become a standard for all server that we're running today and then become a thing, right? Becomes um, the, the gold standard, right? And I see those will happen in many of those. It will just change the way we approach things. And because of that openness, now uh, defensement is in exponential speed because all those blockers are gone. Uh, and that's why I very care and interesting, right? It's, it's literally viral, <laughs> right? It's one yes. to two, two to three, two to five, you know, so much faster than before. Yeah, I agree with that because again, you know, thinking about how you, you want to be focusing on, you know, innovative ways to tackle the problem and not the, the basics of the technology, you know, as more and more gets contributed to this community. And, you know, again, as a very simplistic example, just all of the, you know, the pre-trained models that are now out there, boy, that gives you uh, so much of a faster start. It makes it so much easier to focus on whatever is unique about what you're doing. That's correct. Yeah, especially with the pre-trained model, I think it's a big deal because not everyone have the powerful GPU can train everything from scratch. A lot of people are interested in the outcome, like uh, the use cases, uh, like for example, the BERT, I don't have the database, I don't have all those, but I can turn that into a cooking recipe, which I built for, uh, for demo. And then now instead of reading the recipe, you can ask question about what the recipe can do, like how many eggs do you need, things like that. And you can run that in real time Things that, and that's very different because before when I think about that problem, I think, oh dear, I got to start collecting all the recipe in the world. I got to think about the language model. I got to think about who I got to hire. And I don't even have a dollar in my bank yet. So, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a huge difference. So just to make sure uh, I haven't missed anything important here, could you tell me what BERT is? Is that B-E-R-T? It's a language model that published by Google. Uh, it stands for bidirectional encoder represent representation. And what this will do is, um, so back then when we do machine learning, there's many ways to do this. This one is published by Google that has one feature that we all love, it's called fine tuning. What it means by fine tuning is, when you do natural language processing to understand what the language means and all that, they ever, oftentimes, you, it's very much like one task it can do, like, um, 
like find out where the noun, where's the verb, like things like that. But this one you can fine tune to do things like specifically like what I talk about question and answering. So it will be able to do that, but without retraining the entire model. So you can think about it's like a new uh, processing model that Google came up with with the, but a lot of researchers together, and it's something really like. I would say popular now because uh, it's a new gold standard. Because of that, now you do Google search and all that, you get much better accuracy. So you wonder why why is it so good now? It's actually behind the scene one of the model they use. Makes sense. So before we go, I want to get your thoughts on the coming year. Uh, so this is actually going to publish uh, in January. We'll. Uh, We'll take a little risk here and see <laughs> by the time folks are listening to this, if, if any of our predictions are maybe even coming to pass. But what are some of the, the main trends you foresee happening in this domain in 2021? Mm -hmm. So I got to summarize. I think NLP will be a big, a big thing in the next couple of years. Um, those will change the way we interact with devices. Uh, we saw it in the early time, but now turning to the time where you get call center, things are happening. Uh, a deployment, the IoT will kick, kick in very soon. You'll see a lot of like all the warehouse, all those um, automations. You'll see machine learning in every bit of our industry. And last and not least, I think uh, the growing trend of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, we know we talk about it a lot. It seems like it's a hype back then. But today, when I look at the technology, the maturity, um, the integration of AI and AR and VR will happen because I crave a good content all the time from virtual reality and augmented reality headset. And I think once we put those elements we talk about, recognizing things, how it can create relevant things about your life, your surroundings, it will be a killer app for many things we're doing today. Nice. Well, with that, let me just say thank you so much for, for joining us today. Really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. And uh, have fun as well. And thanks to our listeners for joining us. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to check out insight.tech for more innovative IoT ideas. This has been the IoT Dev Chat Podcast. We'll be back next time with more ideas from industry leaders at the forefront of IoT design.